Welcome to the Ottawa International Writers' Festival. Our 2020 virtual season is broadcasting from the unceded and unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe. Hi, I'm John Geddes, and what a pleasure it is to be here to talk with Thomas Homer Dixon for the Ottawa International Writers' Festival. Professor Homer Dixon is well known to readers in Canada and beyond as the author of two big books in the past, The Ingenuity Gap, for which he won the Governor General's Award, and The Upside of Down, a national business book, a national business book award winner. He holds the University Research Chair at University of Waterloo's Faculty of Environment, and he is the director of Royal Roads University's Cascade Institute in his home province, British Columbia. In short, he's one of our most thought-provoking public intellectuals. We're going to be talking today about his new book, Commanding Hope, The Power We Have to Renew a World in Peril. Tad, thanks for being here with the Writers' Festival. We wish you could be in Ottawa in person, but in these pandemic day times, we're delighted you can join up virtually. Yes, I'm one, it's wonderful to be with you today. Great, thanks. I want to get to the meat of your book very shortly, but for readers who aren't already familiar with you, I want to start with a little question about your early life. In Commanding Hope, you write movingly about your lifelong attachment to British Columbia's forests and shorelines. Could you sketch a little bit about your upbringing so we have an idea of, of where you're coming from originally? Yes, well, I grew up on Vancouver Island, and in fact, that's where I am right now, uh, in, in a rural area. So I spent a lot of my childhood crashing around in the woods, mm -hmm. uh, and and I, I was an only child, and we were living in a rural area, so I, my... <laughs> The forests and wildlands around my house were uh, were my playground essentially, and mm -hmm. that became very much part of my soul, in, in deep in my bones, I guess you could say. And mm -hmm. uh, I've always returned over the 40 years I was away while I was uh, studying and engaged in my professional activities out east. First in Ottawa, then in Boston while I was doing my doctorate, and and then in Toronto and Waterloo. I always kept coming back to this location, in part because my father was alive and he he uh, he uh, had a property in a magnificent location on the on the coast of southwestern Vancouver Island, and so I kept coming back three or four times a year to see him. And I never really left the landscape and the and and BC. It's, I've always considered it my home in a way. And it's it's present that landscape throughout throughout this new book. Uh, but yes. just to bring that that thought about your own childhood full circle, um, in your book you 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 thread through it aspects of I would almost say it's almost a memoir of being a parent that's embedded in this book. Could I ask? There, you must have had some. It must have been a, 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 an interesting thing to bring your own children, your own experiences as a father, into a book that in many ways is a, a public policy book or a, a book about issues. Was that something you had any trepidations about? I, I think it works beautifully. It's poignant. But how did you feel about writing about those intimate experiences? In all my books for trade audiences, I've tried to uh, to have uh, stories that weave their way through the entire arc of the book so that people have a, have a plot line, in a sense. In mm -hmm. The Ingenuity Gap, there was a little girl in India. Uh, I... I had a photograph of her I'd taken many years before, and I decided to go back to find her. And, and that story of Kamal Kamari uh, stretches through the entire book. And there's several stories of a similar nature in this book that provide a kind of, uh, I guess you could get kind of threads uh, that that allow people to step back a little bit from the more academic stuff and uh, and see some more personal engagements. And in this case, because I I've been a, a father raising children over the last at last 15 years. I didn't have the opportunity to travel all over the world. And I realized that the stories I needed to tell were stories that were much more personal, that were that that related to the adventure and the voyage that I was on with Sarah, my wife, and and uh, and the mother, the, our two children, Ben and Kate, and, mm -hmm. and the voyage we were taking as a family together. And in particular, as you know, the book relates, it, it really focuses on the question of what kind of story am I going to tell my children about their future and what their possibilities for hope are regarding that future? 
And I realized around 2016 that that had to be the core of the book. So yes, that's why the children figure very prominently. And as you know, they, there are a number of stories relating to how they're developing as, as young people and how they're engaging with the world that mm -hmm. are anchors, sort of hooks on which I hang the, the larger argument of the book. As a father myself, I, I, I felt very deeply how you were feeling about your own kids, the, the, the tough points when they're learning about hard things about the world. But I think it is a, right. a special part of the book. I suppose I should get into the, the, the substance and meat of the book a little bit here before we get too far in. On about page 50 I've written down here, you summarize some deep fears. Uh, let's see if I can summarize them even more briefly. You say around the year 2030, there could be massive continent-spanning forest fires, rapid rises in sea levels, forcing widespread coastal evacuations, maybe even a nuclear war prompted in part by mass migrations away from, from perennially drought-stricken zones of the world. I, I mention all this as a way of setting up the fact that this all is in the early pages of book with hope in the title. <laughs> Can you say something about bridging from that 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 vision of the future, a possible future, a very possible future, and, and decide your decision to make hope the focal point of this work. So that section that you're referring to is in a chapter called Fighting a Scarcity of Hope. And I'm painting a picture of what I think could possibly be a tipping point in the future, mm. where a series of shocks of the kind that you were just describing uh, cause people around the world to realize that essentially it's too late. It's too late to save things that they value most in their lives, uh, their jobs, uh, the security of their families, uh, and, and that the, the, institutional disintegrate, the institutional environment around them is starting to disintegrate. The societies are starting to disintegrate. And at that moment, everybody realizes that one, one key thing, uh, it, sort of a, a meme that sweeps through the networks, the social networks of the world, and that's the idea that only, this, only those who fight will survive. And so there's a kind of descent into a, into a Hobbesian a fight of all against uh, all. A, of a, mad, a Mad Max world. You, you a Mad Max world. The world. That's right. I call it a Mad Max world, in fact, yeah. <clears throat> because I think that Mad, mad Max movies do probably the best job of capturing that kind of dystopian vision of the future mm. uh, in, a, in a resource lacking or, or scarce world where people are fighting over things like water. And, and I think that, that that psychological tipping point is an, an enormously um, scary, the possibility of that. And it could come quite quickly. The, recently, just in the last few weeks, with the smoke out here and the fires, the sense of psychological despair people are encountering now with the combination of the economic stress, the pandemic, the, the sense that climate change is out of control is really quite stark. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so, so the question then becomes, how do we avoid that tipping point in the future where, where billions of people around the planet suddenly realize that it's too late and that, and that they, they, need to, uh, they need to fight to survive, and only the people who fight well will survive. And maybe in the end, they'll only survive a little bit longer than everybody else because everybody's sort of sliding down the same, same slope together. Mm. So the question then becomes, how do we avoid that? And, and how do we, how do we uh, create a world in which there is still a real possibility for a humane civilization in the future, in which we can invest our hopes? And, uh, and, and so the chapter you're citing really sets that question up. I'm not convinced that that future is inevitable, but it's becoming more probable by the day as long as we don't address these critical challenges that we're facing. And really, the rest of the book is trying to develop an argument for how we can still retain the possibility of a humane future and a prosperous civilization on this planet within the envelope of our residual natural resources and, uh, and, and have hope yeah. in that possibility. Ted, can I can I dig a little bit into the nature of the hope that you say we must we must command? Um, at, at different points, you talk about how humanity is is marching towards calamity of some sort. I think you use that term, um, but you also say that we, I'm quoting here, we must marshal our amazing ability to overcome new challenges. 
to, to me, this sums up a kind of balance or, or almost an imbalance at times that, that, you, or that you're talking about in the book. And, and what I mean is um, the balance or the imbalance between having to see that there is a grim prospect for the future. There is a plausible, in fact, likely terrible prospect. And on the other hand, seeing that, well, we as a species have shown the ability to solve some quite remarkable problems in the past. What I worry about in a way as I read it is that as soon as we start thinking of ourselves as this problem-solving species, we tend to look away from the problem itself and we and we invest maybe too much hope, a kind of a blind faith in our ability to just That's muddle right. through and solve it. Can you talk a bit about that, that dilemma between being clear-sighted but also uh, feeling that there's potential in our ability to fix things? Right. There's a chapter... Uh, titled The False Promise of Techno-Optimists, in which I address that issue pretty directly. Yeah. So uh, it, 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 we, we tend to become overconfident in, perhaps enamored of, our ability to solve problems, especially technological problems, because the technologies we've created are amazing. I mean, look at this technology we're using right now. It's the most remarkable thing. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think that can induce a certain complacency and there is a group of folks, and I would include uh, people like Steven Pinker in this category, who who, suggest, who really argue, well, we've solved all these problems in the past, and life has been getting better, so we should be able to solve all these problems in the future. And we should thinking, have confidence in that. Enlightenment thinking can fix any problem. That's the Pinker sure. model. Sure. And, you know, I'm actually, I'm actually very receptive to those arguments, because I wrote a whole book about the ingenuity gap, about our capacity to to address problems and how mm. remarkable that capacity is. We are, at essence, the most important thing about our species is our problem-solving ability. Uh, but I, I think that we can use that as a way of engendering false hope and not recognizing just how serious our situation is. So it's a, as you're suggesting, John, it's a kind of tricky balancing act. We need, to, we need to be reasonably and rightfully impressed by our ability to solve problems because that gives us a sense of agency, a sense of possibility for pushing through and, and figuring out how to address things like climate change or the pandemic. Mm. On the other hand, we have to avoid the complacency. And so, so in my book, I, I start with a component or a, a, a characteristic of hope that I call honest hope. The, the larger notion of commanding hope that I talk about in the book is composed of, as you know, three subcomponents, honest, astute, and powerful hope. And the starting point is honest hope, which means, which, which is anchored in a, a, a realistic understanding of the challenges we face that doesn't involve any wishful thinking or, or uh, complacency. Yes. So we need, to, we need to understand very clearly how serious this climate problem is and not assume, well, you know, we're amazing problem solvers. We can fix this when it gets bad. It's getting bad now and we're not fixing it. And oh, by the way, the, the time lags in the system means that it's actually very difficult now to stop warming below two degrees. And we can see what's happening on this planet with 1.1 degrees. Mm. If we head to two or three degrees, it's going to be catastrophically worse. Mm. And one of the things I'm suggesting in, in the book is that we have to recognize these long-term trends, or what I call slow processes, that will constrain or bound our future possibilities. And we have to we have to have hope within those possible constraints. Right. Instead of trying to wish them away, we have to say, well, if we have two degrees, how can we still build a prosperous and humane civilization, a, 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 a world worthy of our hope? And that makes the job of hope much, much harder. Because mm -hmm. honesty and hope can be antithetical to each other when situations are very dangerous, like the one we're, we're in right now. Can I ask a question having to do with the way our conversation is just tracked? We've gone straight to what I think, and I'm sure you, of course, you agree, that climate change is the overarching, the, the, the overwhelming uh, challenge. Uh, on the other hand, you also do talk about some of the other disturbing trends or developments we've had in the economy, inequality, in politics, authoritarianism, I mean, in the immediate moment, the pandemic. Um, can, can you talk a little bit about how we should see these various big themes, big problems as being, are they, are they bundled together in some way? Is there a common yes. denominator? Or, yes. or is it better to unbundle them and think of them separately? Give me your perspective on that. No, they're, they're very much 
uh, it's a complex of problems. In a mm -hmm. sense, it's almost like we're looking at a multifaceted, uh, um, uh, multifaceted object of some kind, and we're seeing we're seeing the different facets, and and not recognizing that they're part of a larger whole. Mm -hmm. So, uh, one thing that's very obvious is that is that there are interactions between these problems, between the economic crisis, the climate, the pandemic. If in no other way than just in our heads, because we're feeling overwhelmed, of everything happening simultaneously. Mm. But also, these problems can can, uh, can profoundly damage our institutions, our economies, can uh, cripple our societies, produce ultimately major civil violence. Something I've written about a great deal in the past. But as you know, I spend a fair amount of time in the book actually talking about how these these problems all relate to each other in their causes how then in some sense they all have similar origins. And uh, I build up an entire argument that's actually derived from work I've done earlier, and a lot of which appears in my book, The Upside of Down, about how, how um, human beings are very good at solving problems that are immediate and apparent to them, that they're visible and are short-term problems. And that's, and that's the kind of thing we tend to address. If we're hungry, we, we find ways to feed ourselves. If we're poor, we try to make ourselves wealthier. If we can't, if we want to travel faster from one place to another, we develop, we develop better means of traveling, whether it's the wheel or the internal combustion engine or the jet, mm -hmm. the jet engine. Um, and what happens in this process is we we solve the immediate the immediate and pressing problems, and then we tend in the process we tend to punt a lot of other issues out beyond what I call the horizon of visibility. The, the the horizon of awareness that we have. And those problems sort of accumulate out there. So we, we develop all these transportation technologies to produce carbon dioxide. The carbon dioxide is invisible and it creates problems for people at, far, far away from us and a long way in the future, perhaps our future children. Mm -hmm. So we, we push the problems beyond the horizon of visibility and they accumulate out there. They accumulate and they build up and get worse and worse. And then eventually those problems start rebounding on us and, and affecting things that actually matter to us very directly, whether we can feed ourselves, whether we can be safe in our homes away from wildfire, for example, in the case of climate change. Mm -hmm. And if you look at just about every one of these problems, whether it's the pandemic, whether it's widening economic inequality, whether it's the rising risk of nuclear war, whether it's climate change, they all have this characteristic in the sense of arising from, from uh, solving immediate problems and pushing other stuff out beyond the horizon of awareness, and then it bounces back, it rebounds on us, and uh, and ends up doing us enormous harm. So it's a it's a it's a, almost a, a product of our success. Yes. Uh, economists would call these negative externalities, things that we the negative consequences of our huge success in solving our problems, but that we've externalized them into other places and and onto other people. In many cases, people in the future. So now the future is here, and now our children are paying a price, and so we can't actually engage in this kind of problem solving anymore. We need to we need to develop a greater wisdom as a species when it comes to uh, addressing our challenges. I hope you're right about that. But if I could just uh, make a uh, comment about the news, when when you talk about the the problems are now here, and and I think so. For example, if we think that the the unbelievable uh, forest fires in the Pacific Northwest and California and right going on right now, if we think of that as the sign that, that catastrophic climate change is upon us, and we think, well, therefore, we must start to think about climate change as an immediate problem we must address, that would seem to me to be the wise outcome. But what I have read, I may, maybe you've noticed this too, are quite a few pieces talking about the need for better forest management to prevent, <laughs> prevent forests from being kindling. Yeah. Um, better firefighting techniques, more firefighters need to be on, on, on standby in the Pacific Northwest of California, taking what is really evidence of a, of a very long-term problem that is now upon us and turning it into a, a few smaller, short-term, immediate problems to right. solve. You know, I, I just mentioned that as an example right. of the two, two yeah. ways of addressing <laughs> the problems. Eh? And, there, and there's, the, there's exactly the human response, the very common human response of dealing with the immediate and the visible. Yeah. Um, but the other thing that that is going on there is that these are problems with multiple causes, multiple factors. Yeah. So just about all of these enormous challenges now have have uh, you know even dozens of different 
underlying causes, some of which are long-term processes like the ones we've been talking about, some of which are short, short-term issues such as accumulation of biomass and forests, change in forestry practices, yeah. uh, and, and the like, inadequate firefighting capability. And, and what happens when you have all these different causes is that people can pick and choose as to which ones they want to point to as the cause. Yeah. So we all tend to think very much in terms of monocausality. There has mm. to be the cause. What's the one cause? Yeah. And depending on one's predilections, one's worldview, one's ideological bias, you'll tend to pick the one that, that fits best with your worldview. <clears throat> you know, a lot of conservative folks don't want to acknowledge climate change. So they say it's all about bad forest managed practices. Yes. And they'll, they'll, they'll put in the fact that that's all bad forest management practices on public land. So it's a government failure. Ah, oh, there you go. It's a government failure. <laughs> so we don't have to worry about climate change. And, and, you know, I mean, folks, frankly, and I'm quite, try to be quite balanced about this book. Folks, folks, frankly, from my perspective, who, who, who may be on sort of the left of the political spectrum or center left, would you know instead say, well, it's nothing to do with government. It's yeah. it's about climate change, and it's about our disastrous economic approach and, and, and the way we're we're consuming too many resources. We have to live within our constraints. You know, we have to live within our within our, within our environmental budget. And for the people on the right, that's just that's like death. It's constraint. It means that you have to constrain liberty. It means you have to restrict private property rights. And so. So the multitude of underlying causes for the problem allows people to be very selective in the evidence they point to, and then their an analysis of the situation. And what's one of the reasons that we we don't push forward, we don't make progress in solving these things, because we retreat into our very simplistic perspectives on the issues. Now, honestly, th th what's happening in California is a consequence of a whole bunch of things, including forest min management practices. Yeah. Um, there's this underlying change in climate, uh, uh, but also um, for decades, generations, we haven't allowed fires to sweep through the forest the way they have in the past. So there's been an enormous accumulation of biomass. Mm -hmm. In some sense, both sides are right. And that's it's something I, I, I keep coming back to in the book, that we need to try to bridge these gulfs. Well, I, I want, it's, I'm glad you said that because I wanted to ask you about that exact point. I know some of your work at University of Waterloo in particular has, has dealt with trying to see how we cannot be so polarized, segmented, that there can be more commonality. I know this gets into some complex work and work you've done, detailed work with, in, as an academic, but is it possible to sketch for for general readers, what you see as the ways to overcome the kind of deadlock between competing competing perspectives that that keeps us from from finding solutions. Sure. So uh, in in the book, uh, in the middle part of the book, when I'm looking at at what I call the challenge of hope, mm -hmm. the first part of the book is about the necessity of hope. Really, why hope is something that we absolutely must have, and if we don't have it, we're in it. We're going to create, the, by default, the worst world that we want or that we're, fe we're fearful of. Uh, so, so hope is a necessary condition for moving forward, for having agency to solve our problems. And the second part of the book, uh, it's called the, the Challenge of Hope, which is really about how difficult our problems are and that tension between honesty and hope I was referring mm. to earlier. Mm. And and uh, and and. In that section of the book, I spend quite a bit of time looking at why our problems are so difficult to solve, and uh, and especially the the kind of power relations in our societies, and in particular, uh, I introduce a concept called uh, the worldview institution technology complexes or sets, what we call WIT or WIT sets, mm -hmm. and this is looking how at how worldviews, institutions, and technologies kind of linked together very tightly in our societies. And it becomes very difficult to change any one element because they're interdependent mm. in, in very, very profound ways. But I just I decide at the end of that discussion that the place we need to try to intervene is with worldviews. We need to try to we need to try to get inside people's heads, inside our own heads and inside other people's heads and understand why we think and why they think about the world the way they do. And and I do this in part because in, 
at the University of Waterloo, as you were saying, we've developed over the last a dozen years or so a series of uh, relatively easy to use uh, techniques for analyzing people's worldviews. Mm. And, uh, and so the last part of the book, which is the path to hope, now that I've set up the argument about getting inside people's heads and how important it is to change people's beliefs, the last part of the book is really an introduction of those techniques so that people actually have tools they can use to understand better how they're looking at the world, understand better how other people are looking at the world, perhaps to build bridges with people more effectively to solve problems like climate change or address we just, we pandemic. We just have to. Eh? We must do that somehow. Or, yeah. or it may be just to understand who, who are your implacable opponents and why. Right. so that you can strategically engage with them more effectively in the political contest to solve these problems. Mm. So I'm quite explicit that ultimately the challenge we face is a political challenge, and it's going to require a very large mobilization of people mm. coming together to address, say, climate change, to push the energy transition forward, the low-carbon energy transition. It's going to require the exercise of mass power, and that means you need to know who you can work with and who you can't in this political contest. And, uh, and, and I point out that in the use of these tools myself and in our, within our group over the last number of years, one of the interesting things that's happened is I've understood my opponents better. I've become much less angry and, and, uh, and, and much less fearful of them, of them and much less confused about their perspective. Mm. I may not agree with them anymore, any more than I did before. But, but, I, but I, I can... I can be much more deliberate in my engagements with them and much more effective ultimately in my engagements with them. And that's given me a great deal of hope. I, I also think that what these tools allow us to see and what the focus on worldviews allows us to see is that there's a real possibility for a kind of flip or tipping point in worldviews, especially in conditions like we have right now. Um, the pandemic has been an extraordinary shock to people's uh, views of themselves, views of society, views of government all over the world. Within a few weeks, almost 4 billion people on the planet were locked down. There, there, there's never been an, an event like this in the, in the history of the species when you think about it. Such mm -hmm. a, a global shift in human behavior and psychology. Mm -hmm. If that can happen so fast, then it's possible that there are other tipping point possibilities with respect to the other challenges we face. Very positive. And, uh, so so you, you mean tipping, sorry to interrupt, but you mean tipping into something better that we see, yes, we can do yes, something better. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So, so there's, there's, you know, there's a tendency to assume that tipping points are always bad, but yeah. there have been, and I refer to a number of occasions in history, even recent history, where there have been institutional and psychological tipping events that have happened very fast. The shift in attitudes towards gay marriage, for example, mm -hmm. uh, the collapse of the apartheid regime in South Africa, even the collapse of the East Bloc countries in the late 80s and early 90s, and, mm -hmm. and uh, the, the widespread emergence of democracy in Eastern Europe now. It's, it's challenged, of course, now, but there are still these moments when very positive things can happen very quickly. Mm -hmm. And I think we may be on the cusp of something similar globally right now in part because of all the stresses we're under. And, and, and it starts in our heads. It starts in our worldviews, and that's really what I emphasize at the end of, the end of the book. Ted, you spoke a moment ago about the, the fact that this change will require mass mobilization. I, I guess a kind of global mobilization of, of opinion and, and uh, uh, I guess, participation in getting the solutions. Can I ask something about that, trying to connect two parts of Commanding Hope? You you thread through the book quite a bit of discussion of the uh, movement in the 60s and 70s against uh, nuclear arms testing. It's fascinating stuff, by the way. And you also speak admiringly about uh, Greta Thunberg and the, the youth movement of the last year or two that has risen up with respect to climate change. Um, can I ask two things about that? First, can you sketch a little bit what you see as the sort of lessons from the anti-nuclear testing movement of, of the of decades past. And then if I can do a sort of double-ended question here, isn't there a danger when you start talking about 60s protests, about Greta Thunberg and the kids going out the streets, that some people who think of themselves as sober-minded problem solvers will say, come on, that, that kind of activism is not going to get to the core of these problems. That's about people blowing off steam in the streets. It's not about people getting into the corridors of power and the places where hard decisions are made and making those hard decisions. I, could you address that kind of 
set of problems. Sure. And, and just to go directly to your last point, it's obviously yeah. not either or, right? The, those decisions in the corridors of power are often are often made under duress because of what's happening in the streets. Right. So so it's not as if uh, you, you have to choose one pathway or the other. Right. You might say there's a kind of a good cop, bad cop thing. You need the you need the you need the pressure out in the streets. Yeah. To 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 give give the the policymakers and the politicians the incentives to actually make changes because they don't tend to move ahead mm. of the curve for the mm. most part. So uh, the story you're referring to is a fascinating story. It's a, a it's anchored to the life of a woman by the name of Stephanie May, uh, a, a, a Connecticut housewife in the 1950s who single-handedly managed to mobilize mothers all over the United States to oppose testing of nuclear weapons in the atmosphere. Now, in those days, both the Soviet Union and the United States were testing hundreds of nuclear weapons in the atmosphere. And, and one of the things that was happening is it was spreading radiation all over the planet mm. and, uh, and perhaps in, in almost certainly in, dramatically increasing rates of leukemia in children. And Stephanie had two young children, and, uh, and she was enormously concerned for them. So she began just working from her kitchen table in her Connecticut farmhouse. And, uh, and, and within a period of two or three years, she managed to bring together people literally all over the world. She was part of a global movement of mothers that fundamentally changed the incentives for policymakers and the leaders in the world. Uh, that movement of mothers, which became global and included a movement of uh, uh, protests by mothers and action by mothers within the Soviet Union at the time, mm. uh, fundamentally influenced the development of the Partial Test Ban Treaty in the early 1960s, which put all nuclear explosive testing underground. Yeah. It's so inspiring, and, really. And it's an inspiring story. It's right? very inspiring. I didn't really and, know it well, and I loved reading it in your book. So the extraordinary thing is that um, hardly anybody knows about Stephanie May, and I was able, through complete serendipity, which I'll talk about in a second, through complete serendipity to come across not only her memoirs of the time, her unpublished memoirs, but um, some scrapbooks that included letters from remarkable people all around the world. Uh, whom she worked with and corresponded with or disagreed with, and Bertrand clippings Russell. and Bertrand Russell is in and there. Bertrand Very Russell and, and, wow. and a, a letter that had never it hadn't been seen in some sixty or seventy years that I, I was I pulled out of the scrapbook and it, and it, it, the extraordinary thing is it looks it's like it could have been written yesterday because what Russell was talking about the sense of despair during the early nineteen sixties when a, a moratorium on on testing had broken down between the United States and the Soviet Union, and the two countries had en embarked on this enormous binge of testing, like a hundred tests within a few months. Mm. And uh, and this sense of despair was very, it really echoes the despair a lot of people feel today about a problem like climate change. And what Bertrand Russell says in response is very, still very relevant to our challenges today. Mm. So Stephanie, uh, was an extraordinary person. Her story has not been told, and and uh, because I had access to her, her memoirs and her scrapbooks and her correspondence, I was able to really discern the underlying principles of her hope, mm. and, and that kept her moving, that kept her going. And sometimes she, the obstacles seemed absolutely insurmountable, but she had an extraordinary, extraordinarily astute sense of her strategic environment and what would work well and what wouldn't work well in the political contest she was engaged in. So that's part of what I mean by astute hope. Um, now, the interesting thing about this story, of course, as you know, the punchline is that uh, when I struck upon this, this story, I didn't know who we knew much about Stephanie, but it turns out Stephanie is the mother of Elizabeth May, yes. who is the <laughs> I was former leader of the Green that. Party in Canada. Yes. Yes. And and I, I happen to know Elizabeth and uh, I, do it was too. A, I, I I wrote to Elizabeth and uh, and and she said, oh, well, I think there's some unpublished memoirs around somewhere. And uh, she introduced me to her brother, Jeff, uh, in Cape Breton. And I don't know your your viewers may not actually know the story about Elizabeth's family. But in the early 1970s, after an enormous period, it's very stressful period of uh, political engagement, mm -hmm. Stephanie uh, 
as, as Stephanie's family. They, the whole entire family moved up to Cape Breton in Canada, in part to escape the Vietnam War and uh, the possibility that Jeff would be, uh, uh, would be conscripted. Mm. And so, uh, so Jeff is still living uh, on the property, basically a homestead property in Cape Breton. So I went to Cape Breton, and uh, Jeff provided me with the scrapbooks, which I hadn't known about in advance. Mm. And I was completely enthralled. I talk about being in this little log cabin in, in, uh, in Cape Breton and opening the scrapbooks up and just being absolutely astonished by what I found there. Mm. So that story is another one, along with my, the story of my children. That story is one that goes all the way through mm. the, the book from the beginning to the end. I opened with Stephanie sitting at her kitchen table, making phone calls to uh, clergy members in her community to try to distribute a petition to oppose testing of nuclear weapons. And I close uh, her story with, uh, with a hunger strike that she engaged in uh, on the steps of the Soviet United Nations mission in New York that got national attention and showed that she was actually much more creative and astute in her understanding of how to mobilize opposition to testing than all of the very worldly and renowned and senior folks she was working with in uh, the committee for uh, the committee against nuclear testing in the United States called SANE. And she, all these people were very opposed to her hunger strike, but it turned out her hunger strike was something that, that ended up... Uh, pushing the process forward much better than anything else anybody else was doing. So it's a, it's a fascinating story in the practical application of hope. Yes. And, and I think we all need to see in that story the possibility of how we as individuals can have enormous impacts in the world. One of, one of the things we haven't talked about is that I'm a complexity guy. I, I, I ground my academic work in complexity science. And one of the things we know about complex systems and human social systems are quintessential complex systems is that small things can sometimes make a huge difference. Mm -hmm. Stephanie, Stephanie's actions seem small at, 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 at first, but she ended up speaking, speaking in Trafalgar Square to 100,000 people who were mobilizing in England mm -hmm. to, to, uh, to stop nuclear testing. So if, if she can do that, then we all have that possibility within us. Wow. That is a heartening moment. I could, I'm tempted to wrap it up here, but, but could I ask just one but more? You asked, me, you asked me something else, though, and I didn't answer, and that's, you know, isn't this, you know, Greta Thunberg and, yeah. and the relationship between Stephanie and Greta? Yes. And, you know, is, is, is this perhaps all just sort of window dressing, you know, or, you know, as a Marxist would say, an epiphenomenal, that really what matters in the underlying processes of power and material circumstances of our societies and I don't think that's the case. Uh, I, I, the reason I, I, I found Stephanie, and this applies to Greta too, the reason I found Stephanie's story is back in the 1970s when I started as an undergraduate at the University of Victoria, I, uh, I had a mentor at the time, Bill Epstein, who was the senior Canadian in the United Nations Secretariat, and he was a specialist in nuclear pro proliferation. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said to me at one point, he said, he said, you know, it was the mothers that made the difference. The mothers mobilized all over the world, and they were the ones who changed the calculus for the leaders that ultimately produced the partial test ban treaty, which was the first major arms control agreement hmm. right, uh, between the superpowers. And so I filed that away in the back of my mind for literally 40 years. And, and, then, and it was that little memory that caused me to start investigating who that mother was or who the mothers were. Right, right. I think the situation with Greta is very similar. You know, it, maybe it's the kids who are going to make the difference. And it's the kids who have this morally unassailable perspective on this, on this issue now. They're saying to the adults, you have not taken care of us. Your job, you have one job, which is to take care of us, and you haven't. Hmm. Get your act together and fix this problem for us. Kat, I, I started out by asking a little bit about your own childhood and how that informed your, your has sort of stayed with you through your life about your relationship with your own children. And here you are, you brought us back to the, the concept that maybe That's right. maybe a youth movement, maybe a kids movement could lead us out of the sand. It is a very hopeful, it is a very hopeful uh, thought. Uh, it makes me feel hopeful. But before I let you go completely, and thanks again for being so generous with your time, could I ask, where do you hope that a book like yours will fit 
in the discourse and more than that, I guess, in, in the action and the change that has to take place in the, in the very near future. But can you have a thought on where, I, I called you a public intellectual earlier, where people like you fit in this, they're activists, they're politicians, where does the, the person coming out of academia, out of, out of the kind of deep thinking you do, where do you fit in this, this whole, uh, I guess, push for a solution or for solutions? I think there's some extraordinarily useful knowledge available in some corners of the social sciences and the sciences right now that is, has not been adequately mobilized to address our issues. I mentioned that I'm a complexity guy. There's a whole body of research in complexity sciences that's really quite uh, quite applicable, very useful here. And uh, it, it requires being able to move across disciplines. So I, as you know, I... I, I I'm dealing with psychology, with economics, with physics, with history and philosophy in, in this particular book. Uh, you, you need to be able to bring these ideas together and integrate them. Maybe that's one of the principal contributions I can make. The book is written for a very wide audience, uh, for individuals who are struggling with what to tell their children, uh, for young people who are wondering about their futures, uh, and for policymakers too. Uh, in thinking about the kind of strategic environment, political environment they're operating in. I'm, I'm, I'm hearing from people of all these walks of life now. I had a note from a, a former graduate student uh, just a few days ago, and he said, you know, I read a chapter every morning and it gives me a little hope. Well, mm -hmm. I figured that that's a contribution in itself. Um, but we have, we have some tools. I think there's this sense right at the moment that there's nothing we can do, and I'm far from convinced that that's the case. We have this knowledge that it's used effectively. There are these tipping points in human social systems. We may be actually very close to another right now. It could take us in a very bad direction or it could take us in a very positive direction. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that uh, having this kind of knowledge maybe changes the probabilities a little bit, shifts the balance towards taking us in a positive direction. At least, I hope so. Well, I hope so, too. There we go with hope again. A good point. Thomas Howard Dixon, thank you very much for taking so much time today with the Ottawa International Writers Festival. Good luck on the book. I know it's already making waves. It's on the cover of McLean's Magazine, my, my home base, and we appreciate your uh, sharing so many thoughts, personal and policy-oriented, today. Thank you so much. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.